It's, uh, it's never easy, especially when you're forced into an acoustic session. And uh, so it's, it's always a challenge. And uh, so it's really good. And <clears throat> I'm just talking gently just now, just to let the guys at the bar get used to my voice and the mic and set some levels and, and all that. And uh, But actually, I just want, again, I just want to just say thanks to Lorraine for having the courage to share. It's always difficult. You know, I, yeah, I give a lot of applause because it's not easy. We're giving thanks to God for the promptings and His Holy Spirit. It's not easy to do that, you know, and, and um, to come and share. You know, you know, Lorraine, you're reading my notes. Um, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it's it, it's such a, a confidence as to come as a speaker um, and, and a guest, and especially very deliberately, uh, in, you know, with with you know, it'd be easy to come here and and to, to look at the background of the church and what's happening with the church and, and and to preach into a situation, but to come actually with nothing and just really trust God is giving the message is a is a very difficult and hard thing to do. So to come in to hear words like that this morning really get, it speaks to me, gives me encouragement because this morning we're talking about forgiveness. That's our challenge this morning. So we're going to be talking about this morning, and uh, I hope it's going to be a, as big a blessing to you as it has been to me. Often, when we uh, speak as speakers, <coughs> we're tempted to talk in, um, in, in things that we're good at, things that we're very comfortable talking at. And uh, but to come and talk about something that we're not good at is actually a huge challenge, you know. So uh, don't judge me uh, in, in any way, shape, or form, because forgiveness is something that, that I'm not great at. It's not my strongest skill. Um, you know, uh, Susan will, will say I'm king of cast-up. Uh, well, that's not, I'm, just, I'm getting better. I like to think I'm getting better as, as years go on. So anyway, I'm way ahead of myself. You know, good morning. Let's just start with that. Three of you, four of you, try again, good morning. Good. And uh, I'm trying to use my own voice as well through the speaker. It takes a little bit of minutes sometimes to get used to it as well. And, and this is, if you're, if you're, it's the first time you've heard me, uh, yeah, I haven't been the last couple of weeks, I'll give a special welcome. You'll get used to the up north accent. It, it, it does get, this is the best it gets, by the way. It only gets faster, it only gets stronger. But I will try and keep it as, uh, hopefully as clear as we can. And we're very blessed this morning. We've got graphics and, and uh, I'm f I've got no funny pictures to show you. But maybe next week we'll get some thrown in. Being our last week, we'll maybe let you see some of the stuff you missed out in the previous two weeks, but they uh, were very grateful for all the teams stepping up and making us feel welcome here over the last two weeks, and we're looking forward to sharing again this week and also next week as well. Have you ever been to a conference, like a, like one of these weekend conferences? Have you ever been to one of these conferences you go to? Three of you, four of you, five of you, some of you, some of you, some of you are playing along, you ain't quite playing along yet, you'll learn, I'll pull out you. So you go to these conferences, you go down on a Friday night and then you're there Saturday and so you go first session Friday night. It's phenomenal. Speaker's phenomenal. You're excited. You're buzzing. He, 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 he usually they bring a real great message, and you're like, "Wow, this is fantastic!" I'm I'm so looking forward to my weekend. Message two Saturday morning is very much the same. You're excited. The speaker's phenomenal, and you're like, "Oh, this is ah oh, yeah." I'm looking forward to my day. It was such a rich day. And then session three comes, and it's the one before lunch or just after lunch. And he, and, and 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 all of a sudden the speaker's rolling up his sleeves, and you're thinking, "Oh, it's going to get heavy now. I'm going to have to really get bogged down and stuff." And and then, well, this is where we are this morning. It's going to get heavy now, and we're going to get a little bit bogged down this morning. And I think uh, that there's a saying which is that a short pencil is better than a long memory. And I think that's what applies to you today. So I apologize. There is so much stuff here to get through and go through. But at the same time, it's what God has put in my heart. It's what God has wants me to share with you. I'm up here without my glasses. They're in my inside pocket of my jacket. Uh, I'm always caught by surprise when the band finish. And um, thank you, sweetheart. Lovely. It always helps if I can uh, read my notes, uh, prepare for everything, but no glasses is, is not, not so good, especially when it comes to reading God's Word. So if you've got a Bible with you this morning, let's turn again to 1 Samuel. Um, we have been going through the, the story or, or the relationship between uh, two men, David and Saul, a harpist and a king, a future king and a current king. And we're looking at this fantastic relationship that they've, that they've bonded, how that uh, we spoke about in week one, we're bringing our gift. David was prepared to bring his gift to God's service. God used his harp skills and brought him into the place where he needed to be. And in week two, we looked at the roller coaster of the relationship and how it affects life and how we handle that as an individual and as a church. I hope it's been a blessing to you. And, and, and it really was an up and down relationship. And where we left the story last week was really where Saul had, uh, by the, in the second time, had tried to throw a spear at David. And David had made his escape. And we looked at how, to, how we handle the ups and downs of uh, relationships and, and as churches grow, that it's not going to be plain sailing, there's going to be ups, there's going to be downs, there's going to be challenges. And we, if we're prepared for that, then we can handle it. Don't you agree with that? 
But when it comes to surprise, we're not, we're not, we didn't expect that. Stuff comes out of the blue. We, we don't really know how to handle, how to work that. So we're picking up our story now. And David is on the run, and he's now hiding in a cave. That's where he's at now. He's got a group of men with him, probably around three, four hundred men with him. He's hiding there, and that's where he's currently at right now. And, and, and uh, in chapter 24, where we pick up the story, and we'll read the first sort of 20 verses or so, or a couple of readings. It says, After Saul had returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from Israel and set up to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep, sheep pens along the way, and a cave was there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. You've got to love the Bible. It doesn't really hide anything, does it? Saul needs a toilet, basically. So we're going to have a little pause break. Saul needs a toilet. We'll just wait till we carry on our journey. That's what's, what's happening here. And, uh, so, uh, and uh, so Saul goes into the cave, and uh, David and his men were at the far back of the very cave that Saul had gone into. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke. This is I'm talking to David now. This is when the Lord spoke to you of when he said, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. And David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterwards, David was conscious stricken for having cut off the corner of his robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed. Or lift my hand against him for he is the anointed of the Lord. And with these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left his cave and went on his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My Lord, my King. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and bowed down and prostrated himself. It's lying down with his hands out in front of him with his face to the ground. And he said to Saul, Why do you listen when men say to you, David is bent in harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my, hand, into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lift my hand against my master because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at the piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of the robe, but did not kill you. Now understand and recognize that I am not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord be the judge between you and me. May the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. And down to verse 16 it says, And when David was finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I. He said, You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. Now you want to turn to, stay, to um, Chapter 26, in verse 7, we pick up a story again where Saul has gone home, but then has, has decided to come after David again. And, and Saul now is camping overnight in the middle of his soldiers, in the middle of his army. And David and his right-hand man goes into the army by night. And there was Saul lying asleep, verse, 20, verse 7, inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. And Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. And Abashi said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let him pin, you, pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear. I won't strike him twice. I wonder if he was the same guy who told David in the cave to go and kill Saul. And David wouldn't do it. So now he's saying, I'll do it myself. Look, let me do it, and I'll do it with one blow. But David said to Abishai, said, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As sure as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. Either his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and war jug that are near his head and let's go. So David took the spear and war jug near Saul's head and left. No one knew or saw, or saw what they did, nor did anyone wake up because, the Lord had, uh, because they were all sleeping and the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. And then David crossed over to the other side and stood on top of a hill some distance away. There was a wide space between them, and he called out to the army and to Abner, son of Ner. And again, verse 17 says, And Saul recognizes David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? And David replies, Yes, it is, my lord and my king. And verse 21 says, Then Saul said, I have, I have, I have sinned. Come back, David, to my son. Because you consider my life precious today, I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and erred greatly. In verse 25, and then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son. 
you will do great things and surely tri triumph. So David went on his way and Saul returned home. And may the Lord bless his reading uh, this morning. Our title of our talk this morning is Don't Lose Your Robe. And it's really all around the, the, the topic of forgiveness. And this actually uh, was a passage I was studying when I got a call to come and talk at Kilsyth. And in actual fact, 15 minutes before the call came in, and, and I'm praying with God how I was reading this passage, and actually back in, in the, uh, the, I think it's in the, in the early chapters, uh, when uh, chapter 24 and verse 16, it was this verse that really had an impact in me. And since when I'm reading God's Word, and, and if, you, if you read God's Word and God speaks to you, you know, in different ways, for me, it, it's a verse that really stands out in 3D. It impacts me. And, and sometimes I'm confused, and I don't know why that... But this verse impacted me, and it's where, where, where David has finished speaking, and Saul says, Is that your voice, David, my son? It's this empathy, this melting of a spirit, this melting of, of harshness of, of two people who, who are, are almost at, at, at odds with each other. And this, and this melting of heart, and, and this really impacted me, this relationship between the two of them. And it's very much been on my mind, and this is very much where a lot of our, a lot of our thoughts have came from. We started from here, and we went back to the start of the relationship, and we moved forward towards the end of the relationship. And, and this morning, you know, we are looking at the challenge of forgiveness. And forgiveness is, is, is a challenge. It's, it's, it's one that we, we don't really like to talking about, is it? It's not really one that we're, we're, we're comfortable talking about it. You know, we've all, um, you know, been in the past and in, in, uh, we've read about stuff and, and we kind of skip past the bits we don't like. You know, I, maybe it's just me, I don't know. You know, but the Bible has a lot to say about the word forgiveness and about forgiveness as a topic. It, it's something that we talk about often regarding other people. You know, we, we, we say, oh, well, you know, they, they've just got a grudge or they don't like that person or they carry this. And, but, but we do that whilst often dismissing actually our inner bitterness and unresolved issues or even stuff that we don't actually realize that we are carrying. And uh, I'm going to just uh, tell you a wee story and, uh, about Susan's grandma. And uh, she's probably thinking, Mike, what are you tell my grandma? I never really met a grandma. So I don't know how, sto how true the, the actual uh, story is. But they always used to say that... Uh, the, uh, Susan's grandma, I'm just putting my, my, my iPad off lock because it keeps locking because I was caught off guard. And, and uh, Susan's grandma, if she came up, 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 across a page in the Bible, she'd just tear the page out. You know, because then it didn't exist. She could keep on reading and, and skip past that page, you know. And we used to laugh about that. I don't know if it's true or not. You know, it probably wasn't. It was just probably one of these things we hear about our grandparents being characters and, and the things they maybe do. But we've all got a lot of that in us, don't we? That we come to a passage of the Bible, it doesn't apply to us, we don't like it, so we'll skip past it. It just doesn't, we'll almost ignore it. That way we can remain the perfect Christian. So unforgiveness is one of these topics. I, I, I know there's a, a, sometimes there's, a, there's a particular church at, at, at uh, maybe we through the New Testament, they won't like a whole chapter, but in the middle of the chapter there's one verse that they like. So they'll ignore a the chapter, but take out the verse. You know, we're all guilty to an extent of, you know, reading the bits that we like. And, and the bits we don't like, we just oh, don't really like it because it affects us. So we just skip past it. It's easier to skip past it and we do that. You know, so we're all a lot bit like Susan's granny in a way. We, 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 we tear out and we ignore the bits we don't like in the Bible. But we can't really do that. You know, or maybe we think we're okay. We've actually moved on for that. It no longer bothers us. It was in the past until somebody brings it up. And then there's like an old wound, isn't it, that comes up. It wells up and we find ourselves emotional about, about something that happened in a previous time uh, long ago. And we realize it, it actually it still hurts. It's something that we haven't really quite uh, closed that chapter on. It's very, very difficult. But, you know, when we don't practice forgiveness, we'll see this morning that actually what it does is it, uh, unforgiveness takes us down a, a pathway that's quite destructive. And, and I hope in, in, in my short time this morning, I hope to unpack it a little bit and share it with you. And we've got some slides at the back, and the guys are going to uh, keep up, and, and, and we'll try and take you through this step by step. So it may help a little uh, remember a few things. And, and if it touches your heart this morning, then I pray it'll be a blessing for you. And I know personally, even studying this topic has been a release to me, a huge release to me. For all of a sudden, I, I, I you know there's things that I realized I thought I didn't have any problem with forgiveness and, until I started studying, studying about the topic and realized I had things in my life I needed to let go. And the first thing we'll see here, the first point in the slide behind us you'll see here is, is about unforgiveness. You'll see in verse 25, and, uh, chapter 25 and verse 2, it's unforgiveness blinds a person's perspective. Doesn't it? If you read a passage back in verse 2, 
Saul decides to go after David, and he goes and gathers 3,000 troops. It's not just 3,000 troops. He doesn't go to his palace one day, jump on a horse and say, hey, take them. It says he, cho- he-, he took 3,000 of his choice troops. He gets the Green Berets, basically. That's what he's doing. He gets his SAS guys all together. This is my best of the best, and I'm going after David. David has got 300-plus men and wives and children. That's what he has. He's hiding in caves. It's a ragtag bunch, isn't it? Saul totally loses perspective of actually what's going after. He totally loses perspective. And when we have unforgiveness in our hearts, we lose perspective. We we let it blind us a little bit to the whole perspective of the situation. It all becomes becomes about me, myself, and the offense, doesn't it? That's where it goes, and that's where it comes from. And, And Saul really takes the thing out of context and gets a huge army to pursue a small group of people that's hiding in a cave. The second thing that we'll read from our passage in verse 3 is that unforgiveness blinds us to our position. And you'll notice that, that it says, uh, it, it says Saul, you know, the stop somewhere, Saul goes into the cave to go to the toilet. Well, I'm sure there are other toilet stops on the road. He didn't need to go into the cave. I'm sure there's other places he could have gone, but he goes into the cave. And, and sometimes when we carry unforgiveness in our hearts, we end up going to, pla- to places or putting ourselves into positions that we don't need to be that are just harmful to us. You know, sometimes through unforgiveness, it builds up in our hearts, and some people turn to alcohol, or, or they turn to drugs, or they turn to other vices through unforgiveness. We, we don't need to be there. The other thing I take from that story is, it says that Saul went into the cave, and, I'm, and I know I'm playing with words, and I'm stretching this one a little bit, but often as men, I know that when we have unforgiveness in our heart, we sulk a little bit, and, and we do go into our caves a little bit. I used to have a guy, a friend of mine, and in, 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 uh, I used to do some work with him, and he was in, in business with us a while. And we used to call him, um, I won't mention his first name, we'll just call him Jim. Jim the caveman. You know, and, 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 and I would say to, to our friend, where's so-and-so today? Oh, he's in his cave. Leave him alone. And he'd be stuffed in his head, and, and he'd be withdrawn in his cave. You know, and that's, and that's where he went. It was his safe place to go. And, and that's where unforgiveness puts us. Our unforgiveness takes us to our caves. We lose, we lose sight of both where we're at, both physically and mentally. The third thing we'll see about unforgiveness, this journey of unforgiveness, is unforgiveness blinds us to the person. That's the third point that we see it. Unforgiveness blinds it to the person. This is what really struck me. Was it When Saul heard David's voice, all of a sudden Saul lost sight of the offense and saw the person. And he says that, he says, is that your voice, David, my son? And he says that he wept out loud. But unforgiveness, we really just see the offense, don't we? We lose sight of the person. I'm, I'm sure we've all been there. I, I remember um, a, a while back, and, and uh, the, I was coming to church, and I know you've all been in this position, right? And, and maybe you're saying, oh, no, no, me, but then you have. And you arrive at church, and you see there's somebody not talking to you. Ever been there? You walk in, and you can, you know, you just have that feeling you're getting a little bit of the cold shoulder. And you're thinking, have I done something? Have I said something? I've done something wrong. Have I said something wrong? And, and uh, anyway, you dismiss it and you go back the next week. And, and this was happening over a couple of weeks. And I'm thinking, I've done something wrong. Have I done something wrong here? And so I said to Susan, I said, listen, I'm not sure, but uh, this person's acting a little bit strange. And, and, and I think, I don't know. Um, or maybe she says, oh, no, you're being daft. So church next Sunday, and sure enough, she can go, yeah, sure enough, definitely, I agree. There's something not quite right there. That, uh, acting a bit strange. So I thought, okay, I'm going to have to resolve this, and I'm not good at this thing. I'm, <clears throat> as I was going to say later on, I'm very much a kind of, well, if you don't want to be my friend, it's okay. You know, I've got a dog. I don't need another friend. I'm fine. I, that, that, I, that was the old Michael. Okay, the new Michael's much better, so forgive me. <laughs> Anyway, we met, and we met, we had a coffee with this person, and, and I said, look, we had a chat, and I said, look, the reason why we're here is because I, I'm, I'm not sure, I've got a feeling the last few weeks that, that I've done something wrong, and, and, and if I've done something wrong, I'm sorry, um, but I don't know what I've done, and, and if there's an issue, you know, let's you know, tell me about it, because I, I, I haven't meant it, and the actual fact was the person never even realized they were doing it. There was nothing wrong at all, but it came to such a point where when I arrived at church, all I could see was the offense. Does that make sense? Anybody been there? No? One annoyed him? <laughs> Nobody else? No, just me then. You know, and that's what it was. I came to church and all I could see was I was looking for the offense. I was looking to see, was this person speaking? I'm not speaking. Or was this person going to talk to me today? That's all I could see. And I lost sight of the person. And, and uh, so that's how we went. I, I love going to football. I, I've I always liked football, and uh, as I've told you previously, I'm, I'm chaplain for Falkirk Football Club, so I'm at all the home games. 
And uh, as a chaplain, you know, uh, I often, some chaplains sit with the board, but I'm, I kind of, I'm more in with, the, with some of the supporters, or, and sometimes I'm down just behind the dugout, because uh, I, I chat back and forth with some of the coaches and stuff, and uh, nothing spiritual, by the way, during the game, or no advice, let me tell you, I'm just uh, in, in there, and as a chaplain, you're sitting there, and one of the hardest things for a chaplain to see here is, is, is fans behind you, or sitting beside you, hurling abuse at a player. And they're berating a player. They're berating the number nine, or they're berating the number two, or they're berating the number one, or they call them by their last name, and, and they call them names, and they hurl abuse. You know, and, and, it's, and it's hurtful because what they see, they don't see the person, they just see an offense. They just see the number on the back of a shirt. And if you've been a football fan, you've all been there. And I, I, I remember once going to a Scotland game with a fellow a friend of mine from a church, and, and there was a, um, Scotland had a particularly bad game. And Stuart McKimmy was playing at the time, which shows you how long ago it was. If you're a football supporter, we were playing Russia at Hamden, so actually, what match? And, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, McKimmy gave away the ball, and, and everybody's hurling abuse at McKimmy, and my friend jumps up on his feet, and I think, what are you going to say here? And he went, McKimmy, McK you're just a donkey! <laughs> it was the strongest word I could find, you know. And, and, uh, but as a chaplain, where I hurl abuse at a player or a, or a number on the back of a shirt as a football chaplain, I know that guy personally. I, I, what I see is a young guy playing for his job or maybe playing for his contract. I see a young man playing maybe under pressure to, for, on, under his place or maybe I know he's got relationship challenges and he's doing his best in the park to do his job. But, but the fans are giving him a huge abuse. And it's, it's because they don't see the person. They only see the offense. The fourth one is unforgiveness makes us play the fool. Is there any, Lorenz, is there, is there a wee glass of water or something? Can I get a wee glass of water a bit dry through this morning? Uh, uh, unforgiveness makes us play the fool. A uh, proper diva now. Mike Perry doesn't come and speak anywhere unless he gets a glass of water. That'll be the rumour that starts after this one. <laughs> In verse 26, it say, Saul says this. Saul says, David, I have been a fool. I've been a fool. See, un unforgiveness makes us say things and do things that we'll let our regret. Isn't that true? It makes us say things, thank you very much, Esther. Say things and do things that we'll let our regret. I have been a fool. How sad is it that this is actually some of the last words that David, that Saul says to David. How sad is that? When you're in this fantastic relationship, you know, that, that the two of them had, and, and they were so close. It tells you at the start of our story how David loved Saul, and, uh, Saul loved David in everything he did. And yet, at the end of this journey, he's saying, I've been a fool. This was the great man. Saul was a great man. He was a people's choice. He was a tall, good-looking guy. He was everything I'm not. Eloquent in speech. He was tanned. He had a proper beard. You know, he was the one that people loved to hear. And yet at the end of basically what is going to be the story of Saul, his final words, the words that would be, he would be known by, this is the words that was written on his gravestone. I've been a fool. He was the people's choice. The fifth thing we learn from the story is that unforgiveness breaks down trust. In verse 25, at the end of, at the end of when, when David is taking his spear and his war jug, you know, Saul says, look, return with me. Come on home. Let's put us to rest. Let's put it to bed. Come on back home. But David rejects his invitation. It says that, so David uh, went on his way and Saul returned home. Unforgiveness breaks down trust. As far as we know, David and Saul never saw each other again. Further down in, uh, in the next chapter, in verse 4, it says, When Saul was told that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. How sad is that? That, uh, that was a part in time, the last time the two of them that, that we know of uh, ever saw each other. And there's one more point. I don't want the guys to flick to it yet, but if you've got your Bible open, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 3. And I think this is one of the most impacting things that we need to be aware of if we choose to carry unforgiveness in our hearts. And in chapter 3, it says this. In chapter 3, in the very first verse of 2 Samuel 3, it says this, that the house of Saul warred against the house of David for a long time. The house of David grew stronger, while the whole house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. You see, unforgiveness affects our children and our children's children. This was no longer Saul and David now. This was our, their children and their children's children. The house of Saul and the house of David warred against each other 
for a long time. They said that David was in the run for a number of about four years. And then so this was another two years after, after, after the, the, the death of Saul. How sad is it that that is where and for something that we have held on to now affects our children and our children's children. I can't really get across how important this is. This morning, I believe, this message will set some of you free this morning. I, I believe this morning will help some of you close a door on a chapter and start a new chapter with freshness, realizing and, and that there's been a heaviness in your life. I believe this morning, it will, if you can grasp this message, it will change your life this morning. It will set you totally free. I've been to more churches than I can remember when I've heard the phrase, oh, her mother was like that. Or her, his father was, oh, his father was always causing trouble. Or, I'd, oh, I'd, she had family. They rule the roost. I've heard that more times than I can remember. And I'll tell you what it tells me. It tells me that there's bitterness from a previous generation. And it's sad that we would impact that stuff onto our children because we have chosen to hold on to it. And then we wonder how our churches don't grow because of unforgiveness. My oldest daughter, Lauren, uh, who wasn't coming, I thought she was in the band at Labor today, but she's not here today, so she's going to listen through this story. She's a very determined young girl. She's always been very determined uh, as a person. That's her personality. When I think she was like four years old and her mother was getting her dressed for church in the morning and, and her mum would be trying to button her blouse and she would say, I do it myself. You know, and, and so we have to stand patiently <laughs> looking at what while she slowly fastens the buttons one of our boys, and that was just, Lauren was determined to do things her own way. And I remember one Christmas buying her Heelys for our Christmas or our birthday, and, uh, and, and if, you, if you don't know what Heelys are, I'm sure you probably do, but they're new at the time, but they were trainers with wheels in the bottom, you know, and basically trainers for lazy people. You don't have to run, you can just stand your wheels and, and, and go downhill, you know. So they're, 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 that's what you had. So we had to roll up the carpet in our sitting room, and, uh, and, and with a wooden floor, and, and Lauren would put her on her heelys. I think she was only, probably only five or six or something like that. And, and, and she would go for hours until she got it right. She would practice and practice and practice and practice. And it was one of the first times I, I, I'd really seen a real determination when she set her mind to something, to, 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 she would get it done, and she would get it done right. You know, and, and she was always like that, even in a very early age. I think she was only about three years old, and we were away in a caravan down in, in Ayrshire, and, and, and I, I don't know if Lauren decided at the age of three, or if her dad decided at the age of three, it, it, uh, it was maybe time for her to learn to swim. And uh, we thought it would be a good idea. I thought, well, let, let's learn something. And the idea was really that I would, uh, if she fell in the canal or, or the pool, she could scramble her way back to the side of the pool. So, I, so our, our mum says, oh, well, okay, fair enough, if you think so. So um, we took off our armbands, and, and uh, so I was holding her, and, a little, and I think she was three years old. I'm three years old. Eh? And I stand in the middle of the pool, and I'm saying, well, Lauren, this is the middle of the pool, and that's the edge. This is where you want to be. You want to be here. You want to be there. So, you know, I, so I put her in the water, and, and uh, she went under the water, and I'll oh, we'll just lift her back up again, you know. And her mother says, I, I'm, I think I'm going to just go back to the caravan, and I'll just see you when you're fine. I'm not going to watch this. And I, okay, bye-bye. Fair enough. So, I'm, so it's just now me and Lauren. So Lauren will go to do this. And, uh, yeah, well, I'm going to swim, Dad. Okay. So, right, let's, let's do it again. So I put her back into the water, and, I, and then she went under the water, and I'm standing, and I see her going doggy paddling, and I'm thinking... Swimming or drowning, swimming or drowning, swimming or drowning, no, drowning, okay, up you come. <laughs> Take and give her a little shake, you know. Yeah, we could do this, we could do this. So, anyway, after several times of this whole swimming, drowning, which is a very heart in your mouth moment for a dad, and you're trying to figure out, is that, is that a cry, for, that was a bubble, is that a cry for help, or is that a show, okay, you know? Um, and anyway, eventually she got herself scrambled back to the side of, the side of the pool, and she got herself up into the pool, and, 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 it, was, and it was this great sense of achievement. So, we did that a couple of times, and then it was like, okay, Lauren, on the side of the pool, and I want you to jump in and scramble back to the side. Now you know how to do it, Let's, so if you fall in, you can scramble back. Makes total sense, doesn't it? Yeah, it make absolutely total until it's your kid. You think, what is that crazy man doing with my child? You know, go to swim easy or something like that. It's not, my way is not the professional way. So Lauren would we'll jump in and just scramble back to the side and jump in and scramble back to the side. And I said, okay, now Lauren, this is the ultimate test of trust. You've got to hold on to the side and like go and swim to your dad. And I would step back. And this was really the ultimate test. I had to coax her that I should leave her place of safety, the place where she was hanging on to, because she knew that's where she was comfortable, and she would trust her father to swim out into the pool to get to me. 
This was the real test. And after a few times a coxner, she would let go and eventually she'd scrabble out to me and I would pick her up. And I'm sure you've all been there if you've ever taken a child to swimming lessons and then he put back again and the next time he take a little bit step further back and they swim a little bit further every, every time. And they say, you're stepping back further. No, I'm not. And you're, it's, it's uh, sorry, Lord, if I lie, I realize I lied there. If I, but you know, it's one of these kind of things. And, and, and but Lauren eventually realized that in order to get to me, she had to let go. You know, and she knew that to, to get to her father, she had to trust him. She had to let go of what she was hanging on to and get to me. She had to trust him and learn to swim in the, the arms of her father. She, she had to trust that her father had got this. She had to let go. And maybe this morning, you need to let go. You need to let go of what you're holding on to in order to swim into the arms of your father. Unforgiveness works exactly the same way. You see, you can't grow until you let go. And it doesn't matter how much you fight it, how much you argue against it. The fact of the matter is, the Bible teaches us that, that you can't grow until you let go. You've got to let go. God wants you to let go. We've all had issues. Some of us have been hurt. Some of us have been let down. Maybe you've been lied to, maybe cheated on, maybe you suffered physical abuse this morning, not this morning, it doesn't happen, but maybe you suffered physical abuse, or maybe you've suffered mental abuse. We've all had issues. We'd all like our five minutes to say what we really want to say, just to get it off our chest, isn't that right? We'd all like our five minutes. We, we, we want people to hear our side of the story. We want people to, 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 to listen to where we can justify ourselves. We want people to, to get, we want a chance to defend our character, don't we? And we want to express our anger just for five minutes without judgment or condemnation, maybe in front of the person. But this morning, God is asking you to let go. How do I know God's asking you to let go this morning? Because one, I, I totally believe what God gave me this morning was for this church. And I, and I believe Lorraine confirmed it this morning when she stood there and spoke this morning. It was a challenge to share about unforgiveness and forgiveness. And challenge, that's what she spoke about this morning. That's how I know God is challenging you this morning in this church. There's a great, uh, uh, it's not a great film. Don't go watch it in my recommendations. I can't remember what's all in the film. I don't want you to watch it and say, oh, Mike, you watched that film. But it's a very funny film called Get Smart. It's about a spy, a spy. It's a comedy. I saw a, 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 a spy who's not really a spy. He's just he's very clumsy. And, and he's got a thing called the cone of silence. I don't know if anybody ever seen the film. No? Don't watch it. Anyway, <laughs> I, I didn't recommend it. In the cone of silence, he's around his desk and he puts it on a table and he bangs it. It's futuristic. Cone bubbles out over him, and he can say what he wants to say. The people outside the cone of silence can't hear him. And, and, and they can rant and, and rave to each other, but the guy can't. I don't know what you're saying. And he says, I hit you this morning with the head with a fire extinguisher. And his boss says, No, I don't. What did you say? What did you say? And, and, and I think sometimes we, we like that. We love just to have a little bit of cone of silence where we can just press the button and this cone of silence goes over us, and we can just get two minutes to say, <laughs> <laughs> and get it off our chests, just for a few minutes. But unless we learn the grace of forgiveness, we can never move on. We'll hold on to that for year after year. I've been reading through a, a, a speaker who I really admire. I don't know, his name is Dr. John Andrews. He's a, a, great, he's a great speaker. He's one of these guys that every time I hear him, he impacts, he impacts, he impacts. I can remember some of you hear so many speakers over the years, and, but this guy, when, when John comes and speaks, or when I've heard him speak, I, I can remember what he said the last time I heard him speak. It's, it's, it's so powerful. But he wrote a book about, called The Real Effort, and and uh, we bought it years ago, we went through a, a kind of tough situation. I, I, I bought it for Susan. How, how righteous is that of me? I, I bought it for my wife. You know, not that she was trying to forgive me, but just I, I knew she was struggling with some stuff. And, and of course, I never read it because I, I didn't have any issues. But I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to read this book. I read it, I started about, a, about, about oh, four weeks ago. And, 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 I, and I really, it was a real, I couldn't put it down. It so impacted me. And again, if you're struggling with forgiveness, you know, you, you, can, you can have this one. You know, have this one, you can buy it on Amazon, I, I, don't, I don't mind. But um, just come and get it for me at the end. 
But he, he writes this here, and this is a story which I want to share with you on this topic of unforgiveness. He talks about the Enniskillen bombing in County Firm. I remember the Enniskillen bombing. I had a, I had a business over in Ireland. I had actually friends in Enniskillen at the time. But God, thank you, God, they were, they were uh, uh, spared of the bombing. They were in that particular uh, street. Eleven people were killed and 63 were injured by the atrocity. That received universal condemnation. It promised to be another routine act of barba barbarism. Acknowledged, accepted, and then most are forgotten, except by those who have suffered at its hand. However, one man ensured that this event will be remembered for something out of the ordinary. Whilst in an interview, Gordon Wilson, whose daughter Marie died in a blast while holding her father's hand. Just put yourself in that shoes for a wee minute. Died in a blast whilst holding her father's hand. Declared that he forgave his beloved daughter's murderers. He rejected calls for revenge and retribution. I bear no ill will, he said. Dirty, so dirty sort of talk is not going to bring Marie back to life. She was a great wee lassie. These profound words from a simple man provoked responses for all over the world. Let me tell you, if Gordon Wilson, if Gordon can show unforgiveness, then so can we. I think he knew that unforgiveness led to the, one of the most destructive char characteristics of all, which is bitterness. Artie Kendall, a great writer, and, and I, I love Artie Kendall's stuff, says this. He says, I've come to the conclusion that the chief way to grieve the spirit is through bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15 says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up and causes trouble and defiles many. That's what the Bible tells us about bitterness. And, and, and that verse, if you break it down very quickly, it says, see to it. That means it's in your control. If, if, when I was, a, in, I was a taller man for 10 years, and if I was working the deck of the fishing boat and someone said to me, Mike, see to it. You didn't ask questions. You, you went and did it because I was told to see to it. And, you know, and I don't know if it's a phrase you'd use down here in Colsythe, but go and see to it. You know, I mean, that, that means it's in your control. It's see to it. And it says, that, it goes on to say that, that, that no one falls short of the grace of God. That means, that, that means you can't, you're not going to be saved. What it means is you're going to lose out on the blessings God has for you because you're carrying unforgiveness in your heart. Sometimes God can't do something for you because you're carrying unforgiveness. He says, don't fall short of the grace of God. And then it goes on to say in the verse, causes trouble. You know, unforgiveness causes trouble in our lives. Some of us you know, are struggling with challenges of life, maybe uh, from, from, from relationships to health challenges. And, and some of that is, it goes back to unforgiveness because it causes stress in our lives. And there's all kind of reports and, and stuff for scientists to show how stress and stuff can affect our own health. You know, see to it. You know, that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up and causes trouble. And then the last bit says it defiles many. What we carry, this bitter root infects other people. It's not just about us anymore. It's about other people around about us. Ephesians 4, 30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, among every form of malice. It's a command. This is the way God wants to live our lives. And then it says this. It goes on to say, look, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. That's you and me. Forgiving each other in the church. We didn't mean for bad to come out of it. Forgiving each other, because good can come out of it. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. And to me, that's a nail in the coffin. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. He forgave me. He forgave me. Kendall goes on to say that bitterness is a sure sign that the evil one is at work. The very word bitter, pikria, is the, is the sort of Greek word for it. I don't, I don't know much Greek, okay? There's a joke that says the only Greek I know is a wee chipper in the corner. It's a really bad joke. It's a preacher's joke. You've heard it many times, I'm pretty sure. But the word actually means accredity, accredity. And I'm told that's the right way to pronounce it, accredity. But actually what it means is poison, sharp or harsh unpleasantly pungent in taste and in odour. And we've all met people like that, haven't we? 
We can think of people we've been around and we thought they're just unpleasant to be around. They're very sharp in their opinion, harsh in their opinion. And sometimes we are that people. But it says that it's, they're pungent in taste and in odour. We don't want to be around bitterness because that's what it makes us. We don't want to be that particular person that people are avoiding when you come in on a Sunday morning and, and you say, I'm not going to ask how they are. That's a wrong question to ask in the door. Susan's in welcome team at church, you know, and, and often we say, how are you? And have uh, ever been there and you think, oh, I wish I'd never asked that question. And <laughs> 10 minutes later, you're still standing there, you know, this size, you know, and you're, you're, ducking, uh, you're ducking the javelins as they're coming towards you, you know. But when we're bitter, the same song plays over and over and over in our minds. And the conversation with those that are closest are negative. Have you ever noticed when, you're, when, when, when stuff happens, it's bad stuff, and, and you're really angry and you're, you're bitter, and, and you, that, that you talk to your husband, and it's all, it's just, this conversation plays and plays and plays all the time, doesn't it? And whenever you go and talk about that particular subject, then the same conversation starts again, plays and plays and plays, and all you're doing is you're feeding each other's negativity. You're just feeding the bitterness in each other's, in each other's lives. If you're spreading your bitterness out to your spouse, out to those closest to you, or if it's maybe we your best friend, you know, you're, you're bitter, and now the conversation is always bitter. I was listening to a, a, a podcast the other day, and, and uh, Steve Furtick and T.D. Jakes, it's a fantastic podcast. It's one of the best I've ever listened to. If you haven't heard it, you need to listen to the interview between the two of them. And, and uh, 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 Furtick, Steve Furtick asked T.D. Jakes, he says, when people leave you, when people leave, when people leave your church, pastors often go, well, it's just a pruning of the church. And, 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 and T.D. Jakes says, yes, but the harsh reality is maybe they just don't like you. <laughs> maybe you're just, you're, you're, you've got a bad odour, you've bitter. You're just, you're just not a nice person. And, and some of that is a harsh reality, is, is actually we need to question what's in our lives. There's something I'm carrying in my life that's, that's spreading on to other people, that's infecting other people, that, that's, that's going on. You know, our family senses unpleasantness. You know, we spread to our family, our children, uh, our relatives, our, you know, our parents. Then we'll become disconnected with the church, and then eventually we'll become disconnected with, with God, and then we become victims, not victors. We're sitting here this morning, if you've had Jesus Christ in your life, we're sitting here this morning as a victor. And how do we hold on to the role of the victim? We become to play victims rather than victors. In the real reality of unforgiveness, and the thing that the evil one doesn't want you to know this morning is that unforgiveness and bitterness is a choice. And, that, and I think when I grasped this truth, for me, it was a light bulb. All of a sudden I realized that I could open the door of prison and I could walk out. Because we become bitter because we took offense. Somebody caused the offense for whatever reason, but we chose to take it. The very word took is a verb. It's to get into one's hold or possession by voluntary action. The very phrase took offense. I have taken offense. I took offense at what you said it means that we stepped out, we picked it up, and we held on to it. We have taken offense. We've took offense. It's a voluntary action. And this truth has a power to set us free from the prison of unforgiveness when we realize actually we're in this prison and we can't get out and actually we're standing with the keys in our hands all we've got to do is put the buttons down and open the door and step out and in this, in this phrase we don't when we don't forgive we remain a prisoner to their offense we remain a prisoner to their offense it's a challenge this morning and it's obvious and sometimes it's possible that they go on with their lives totally oblivious to our pain. I spent weeks thinking that person didn't like me. I spent weeks thinking, oh, I don't know what I've done wrong. And it became a topic of our conversation. And when I met the person, I said, have I done something to offend you? If I have, I'm really sorry. I, I don't know what it is, but you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I want to sort it. And this person had no idea, totally oblivious. Totally oblivious. And we need to ask ourselves this morning, is a grudge really worth it? Is a grudge really worth it? And you know, the last two weeks, the things I've spoken about, about this almost like a starting point to bring our gifts, and we prepare for the roller coaster, we prepare for growth. It's all expectancy, it's part of the, the kingdom builder message I'm trying to take you. Actually, none of that actually matters if you can't grasp this this morning. None of it matters. 
because we have, uh, this means we've got something to deal with in our hearts first before we can move on. I, I love the book of Proverbs. Um, we had a, an Amazon, a lot of confession to make with an Amazon delivery this week. And, and then it, uh, Lauren's got an Amazon Prime account, which we all use, much to her annoyance. And all those books arrive and I say, Lauren, is this for you? No, it's never for me. It's usually the answer. So there's a book arrived and, and, and I think they said, there's a book. Dad, did you order a book? No, I never ordered a book. I've got like, a pile of books right in my bedside. I'm trying to read through just now some great books. And uh, no, no, I didn't order a book. I've, I'm, 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 I'm loads of books. And Rachel, you order a book? No, I didn't order a book. So they decided to open the package. And I heard Lauren saying to her mum, Rachel won't mind if I open it. And no, no, because we don't know what it is. So Lauren opened the book. And it was a book, it was a, it was a, a commentary through the book of Proverbs. <laughs> and I, oops, it must have been mine. I, don't, I have no recollection of ordering the book. I don't know why I ordered the book. And, uh, but it must have caught my attention. It's Proverbs, and it's, it's about leadership and life skills and Proverbs, and it's a year. And I thought, well, yeah, I'm, it's one of the third thing I'm reading a year through, so I've got a year of very busy reading. So it's my book, <laughs> the book of Proverbs. But Proverbs 1911, well, Proverbs is fantastic, and you need to read it at least once a year through the book. I change, I, some, some years I'll read it at New King James, next year I'll read it in the Message, next year I'll read it again, and every year I get stuff out of it because of, of where we're at in life. And Proverbs 1911 says this, a person's wisdom gives him patience, but it is, it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. So how do we let go, and how do we forgive? And before I go there, I just want to say something a little bit as well. Because as we talk about offense, you know, you, you are forgiven if you're sitting there thinking, well, it's okay for you, Mike, but you haven't been through what I've been through, and, 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 I, and I haven't. And you know, maybe it's okay for you, Mike, but you don't know my personal situation, and the truth is, no, I don't. You know, we've all had tough times, but yours maybe is a lot worse than my tough times. I don't know that. But there are some truths I want to share with you. Number one is we can forgive, but it, it can still hurt. We can forgive, but that can still be a sore point in our lives. We can still forgive. We can forgive, but depending on the, on, on the offense, it can take time to heal. In some cases, years. But we can forgive, it'll take time to heal. We can forgive, but we'll never be friends. You may never sit around the kitchen table again with that particular person or, or do business with that person, but we can forgive, but you may never be friends. And we can forgive, and there may never be reconciliation. That's the truth of forgiveness. Because you, see, you can forgive, it's you that's letting go. You're in no control of the other party. So the things we can do to help us this morning and forgive is, to do, is I want to leave you with something practical. Number one is you can pray about it. It should always be our first port of call. We need to get on our knees and pray about it. Pray into that situation. The Psalms is full of the prayers of David. Psalm 7, Psalm 27, Psalm 31, Psalm 34, Psalm 52. I thought you could read out the Psalm this morning, one of my Psalms, but you just missed it by two chapters, but your point was still very good. You know, amazing. You know, Psalm 34, you know, they start out usually with a cry and they end with a declaration. You know, David understood all this. He would go through this. Psalms 34, he writes these words, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in, in him. Do you know who he wrote that psalm? He was in the city of Gath, pretending to be a madman, with drool running down his beard, scraping at the gates so that people would leave him alone and think he was harmless. And while he, while he was there, he says... Remember, that's a guy who lived in the palace. This is a guy that the, that the, that the, that the, the, the people would sing about him and sing praise to him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. That was written at David's lowest point, when he lost everything, including his dignity. We need prayer, but we take it to God first. Second is we need to humble our hearts and examine our own hearts. That's where we start. Verses 20, uh, verse 8 in chapter 24, it says, David bows down to Saul. He acknowledges Saul as my Lord and my King. In verse 10, he acknowledges Saul as my Master. In the next verse, he calls him my Father. We start with us. We don't start indignant. We start with us. Susan's a great example uh, for if she, if she thinks she's hurt somebody or offended somebody, she can't sleep at night. So she's got to go and pick up a telephone and she's got to make a phone call or, or, or go and talk to a person on Sunday morning and say, listen, I'm sorry, I, 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 text, I text message came across wrong, I didn't mean to upset you, I, you know, you know, 
she, she's at what she does at her character. And as I told you, I'm like, well, if they don't want to be friends, that's fair enough. I've got the dog, and it's fine, you know. I mean, dog, <laughs> dog's great, it likes me every morning, you know. Uh, I'm much better now, and, and God's working on my, on, on my grace, you know. But we need to be more like that, where, where we look at ourselves first and we say our stories first. You know, Matthew 5 22 said, Tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And that doesn't mean you're going to be judged harshly. It just means when you slip up and you say, oh, oh should I, God, please forgive me for I have a sin. God's going to say, yeah, of course I forgive you. But you haven't forgiven them. I'll forgive you, but you need to forgive them. And he'll remind you that. He'll remind you that. Because you'll be judged by however you live your life. Corinthians 11.28 says, everyone, who, who ought to exa- everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. You know, I know that every other Sunday you guys break bread here. You know, we need to examine ourselves. And actually, I'm breaking out. I'm giving thanks to God. For what? For forgiving me. And I'm carrying a grudge against them. I need, I need to sort it out. I need to take action. I need to forgive. It may be that God can't move on with his purposes in your life because you haven't cleared up a blockage yet. And, and I know it was a great truth in my life. I knew that God couldn't do stuff for me because I had stuff I needed to sort out. I needed to sort, it, sort them out. David knew he was wrong. Immediately when David cut Saul's robe, David knew he was wrong. His conscience bothered him. And he knew, I, I shouldn't even done that. That was really, I was childish. Why did I do that? You know, and he could justify it all he liked because, but again, Proverbs 31, 2 says a person, all, all the person's ways seem right in his own opinion. We always think we're right. I was right to do that. I never did it. It wasn't me that started it. It was them that started it. They said that, so I did that. We can do that all we like, all days long. But then Proverbs says, but, but the Lord evaluates the motives. He, he knows what's in our heart. He knows what's underneath the skin. And Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. You know, the Bible has a great deal, great deal to say about, how our, uh, about our hearts and how we ought to to live. Rodney Smith, the evangelist, said, a, said, a, said a, a, a line, and it's brilliant, and it says, there are five Gospels in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Christian. And most people don't read the first four. Think about it. Five Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the Christian, and most don't read the first four. Well, how we live our lives speaks more than anything we'll ever do or see. The third one, the first one was pray, the second one was humble ourselves, and the third one is see the person, not the problem. Saul says, is that your voice, David, my son? And then he wept aloud. All of a sudden, Paul sees, Saul sees the person. He sees the, he sees the person, not the guy who he perceived, perceived to be a threat to him, not the guy who never meant to cause Saul any offense, but David. Is that you, my son? You know, when somebody sends you a text message and it really winds you up, try and read a text message with a smile. Or read it in their tone of voice. That's what we often do. We think in our heads like them. If they've got a lot, we read the text with a little lot. And it helps a little bit, you know? And I ask yourself, did they really say that? Did they mean that? Or did they really mean when they did what they did? Did they mean this to happen? And often the case is actually no. It's not. It's something that, we can, be, that can be resolved. Learn to see the person, not the problem. Fourth, as if possible, talk. It's always a good place to start. It's not always possible. You know, there are some horrible situations in life and you know, it happens, it, it, that can happen to an individual and, and it's just not possible to talk because they're really bad and they're really dark. But in a lot of cases, it, it, we can talk. In verse 8, it says, David came out of the cave. You see, the cave wasn't neutral. That was David's stronghold. If David had challenged Saul in the cave, while well, Saul was in the cave, Saul would have been... Oh, spare my, forgive my, forgive my life, spare my life. I'm sorry, because David was in command. David was in David's territory. And then in the next story, when it, at the enemy camp, David didn't go and wake up Saul and said, hey man, it's up north phrase, hey man, it's up north phrase, that one. What are you doing? What are you after me for? Because immediately the guards would have grabbed David, dragged him away, and Saul would have been in charge. That was in a neutral place. You know, make a call, meet him in a neutral environment. Talk respectfully. Apologize if you think you've caused any hurt. And look, I don't know what's happened. I know it's, we're, we're not going to be worshiping together or we're not going to be working together. Or we're, I, know, I know we're on different paths, but I want to say, look, I'm sorry if I did anything to upset and offend you. That was never the intent. Start with that. 
Start with that. Number five is don't look for an apology. That's a hard one. And if you start with the phrase, listen, I want to meet you to say I forgive you, they're going to get their backs up. <laughs> they're going to say, what, you forgive me? You forgive me? <laughs> I'm talking like an Italian now. You know, you've been seeing a godfather or something. You're talking to me? <laughs> but don't look for an apology. Don't expect them to be excited because you said you've forgiven them. Ask for forgiveness first. And if they say the same to you, then you can put it behind you and you can move on with your lives. David made his case before Saul in verses 12. He made his case before Saul and he asked that God be his judge. David didn't matter, it didn't matter to David whether Saul said sorry or no, but David had to forgive Saul for, for, for what he was doing. It was tough. And the last one is practice forgiveness. And there's a, there's a parable in, in, in Matthew 18, and the parable is very hard, and, and, and it gets right to the point, and it tells you about a king and who has is, is got a, a businessman, and a business, businessman is really, this wealthy man is owed the king about 10 million pounds. That's about the sum of money approximately that he's owed him. And, and the king says to him, you know what, I'll tell you what, I'm going to forgive you your debt, on you go. You can't pay this debt, on you go. I'm going to, I'm going to pay it off for you. On you go. And a wealthy man walks outside the palace, and the first thing he does is he sees a servant who works for him who's owed him a hundred pounds. And a wealthy man pins him against the wall by the neck and tells him, I want my money, I want my money now. And if you don't give me my money, I'm going to, I'm going to take your family from you, I'm going to take your life, take everything you have. I need my hundred pounds. And then the king hears a story about the wealthy man, what he's done to his servant. And the king sends his soldiers to get the wealthy man to come back in, and he says, I forgive you 10 million, and you couldn't even forgive a hundred pounds. And he says to the soldiers, throw him in jail. Throw him in jail. I would not do this guy. Send him away. Matthew 18. I was going to ask our uh, organist to come up this morning and just as we wrap things up, but we don't have one. You know, I threatened to bring my daughter's organ and get her to go up here and play. And if she's refusing to come up and play the organ either, thankfully there's not an organ. So she's got off late this morning or she would have been up here playing just now. We're going to bring this to a close in a little minute and I'm going to ask the, the, the worship team to come up. You know, my prayer this morning is that, that you'll be released from the prison of unforgiveness. And most of us here never realized that the door was never locked. That's the truth of the matter. That the door this morning was actually never locked. We've had it in our grasp all along to lay down the offense that we took and to open the, door of, uh, open the prison door and step out. We just have to trust God and leave it with him. And my prayer this morning that you will be able to do that this morning. A few years ago, I was chatting earlier, and we lost our business a couple of years ago. N nothing that we had done or our business, but it was, a, it was a parent company. And we lost it because of decisions that other people had made through wh whatever reason, uh, whether they made it or whether they were right decisions or bad decisions or whether it was greed or ambition or self-interest, but, but that business closed down. And we lost what was our, our main business. It was our core business. That was our livelihood. It was our, our pensions, our children's future. It was everything. And, and in most cases, we, we, we should have been devastated. And actually, it took me about 68 months to get over that, that, that hurt that was caused through that decision and, and the things that went on behind the scenes. And, 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 and looking back, I realized that actually I had shut myself in a prison of unforgiveness. I carried that. I'd allowed that bitter root, a bitter root to grow up inside of me and to the point where I was just really angry and I wouldn't even talk about certain people because I'd be angry at even talking about them. And I realized now that actually I was carrying that burden. And, and I can tell you this morning, I'm free, because of, of even the blessing of this lesson, I'll be able to free myself from that burden. Even, even I released it a year or so ago, but even again, the reminder actually that, that I, I, I'm not going to pick that up anymore because through that offense, what happened there, God is a new path and there's new plans for us and will do new things for us because we've forgiven that and I'm looking forward to seeing what God has got for us in our next chapter. And I realized that what happened was more about them than what happened than was with me. So I can let that go. I can walk lighter now in the morning. I don't have to carry the burden of offense. Jesus was our ultimate example of forgiveness. You know, and, and Jesus has been dragged through the streets and he's being humiliated. And he's been taken along and he's being beaten to basically an inch of his life. And then when they get him to the hill, they pin him down in his hands, open wide, and they hold his arms and his fingers, and they put a nail here, and they hit a hammer, and the nail drives through the palm of his hand into, this, into a wooden cross. And then they raise that cross up, and they leave him hanging until he dies. It was a brutal execution. And he's hanging there, and his first words he says is, Father, 
forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. May we be like him this morning. I just want to take a chance with every bow our heads a wee minute. And just maybe in the quietness of this room, you know, I always want to say that, you know, maybe you have never been forgiven. Maybe you've actually never asked Jesus into your life and have your sins forgiven. And maybe you're thinking this morning, well, Mike, I'm not really a bad person. I, I'm, not, I'm not a sinful person. Sin just simply means you're not living the way God wants you to live. That's all it means. It's not, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. You just, you just haven't given your life to God. You're not living the way as God wants for you. And if you've never asked Jesus in your life this morning, if you just raise your hand and take it down, I'll pray with you, I'll meet you at the end, and we'll maybe give you something away with you. As anybody this morning would like to accept Jesus into your life, just raise your hand and take it down. And maybe this morning then that you're struggling with forgiveness. This, maybe this morning, this passage, this, this, this wee short time together has really impacted your life this morning. And maybe you're challenged with you're carrying something in your heart that you know it's a better route and you know it's not good for you, it's not good for your family, it's not good for the church, but you're still let go. Just to raise your hand and I'm going to ask you to raise that wee minute and then take it down and we'll, we'll pray for you. So anyone just want to raise their hand? Thank you. Thank you. If you're, maybe you're struggling this morning and you think, you know, no, I'm over it, but actually, no, I'm not over it. It hurt. I'm still carrying that inside. I've got an anger inside. Just raise your hand and take it down. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to just dwell on this now a minute. Okay, thank you. Let's just stand. Let's stand together. We'll bow our heads. Father, for those who have responded this morning and, and lifted their hands, Father, I, I pray for them. Father, I pray that their, their courage to lift their hands, that you will help them release this morning. You'll help them find that forgiveness this morning, that we'll realize if, if you can forgive us of our sins, if, Father, we can forgive other people. Father, and, and follow your example. Father, I pray that you will, you will destroy the bitter root that grows up inside of us, Father, that infects us, that it's a poison, Father, that it spreads through us. And, Father, affect our relationship with you, Father, our relationship with each other, our, our relationship with the church, Father. And, Father, most importantly, it stops us moving forward in, in, in the path that you would have us, Father. We want your blessings this morning, Father. I pray that you'll bless the church here in Colsaith this morning. I pray, Father, that you will release them from any unforgiveness that's in their heart, that they will forgive things in the past, that they can see now, Father, with forgiveness, Father, they can open a prison door, Father, that the bitter root that's inside, Father, them will die, Father, and wither, and will be no longer an issue, Father. And they will receive a lightness, Father. They'll be able to walk out feeling better, Father, feeling like that, that you are in control. A little bit, Father, like the story we heard, Father, a lord in the pool, Father, where she had to let go in the realization she has to trust her Father, she has to swim to her Father's arms. Father, I pray this morning that we can let go, that we will can trust you enough that we can swim into your open arms. Father, we thank you for all you've done in our lives. We thank that you died in the cross that we could be forgiven. So, Father, help us forgive. We know that we can forgive and still hurt, Father. We know that it still can be sore, Father. But we know that if we forgive, Father, if we can forgive, we can start to move on, Father. Help us pray and continue this journey with you this morning. In your Savior's precious and worthless name. Amen. Thank you so much. And we'll invite the worship team to come up and, uh, and uh, close the meeting. 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 says... Pursue love. Pursue love. And I pray that this will be your anthem in the week going forward from now on. Thank you.